Um, thanks for inviting me, and this is a privilege to be sitting at this uh, panel. Um, I'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, INOCA, and um, so it's pretty much ischemia and infarction in an open artery setting in non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, I have uh, no disclosures. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is um, how do you diagnose? Um, and um, diagnosing myocardial ischemia or infarction in a non-obstructive coronary artery disease, we look at three criteria. The first one is, uh, does the patient fall into acute uh, MI criteria, right? So what is the universal definition of MI if the patient comes in uh, with chest pain or symptoms similar to uh, coronary artery disease with MI, has EKG changes or echo changes, also, there is a rise and fall in troponin, at least 99% of um, uh, the normal for the lab. So if the patient meets all these criteria, then uh, that's the criteria for uh, acute MI. The second criteria for MINOCA or INOCA is uh, once we do the coronary angiogram or coronary CTA, so these patients should have um, um, blockages that are less than 50%. So anywhere between 0 to 49%, if their coronary arteries are obstructed, then that's one of the criteria. And then no other clinically overt specific cause that can serve as an alternative cause for the acute presentation. So if you're going to rule out acute pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, things like that, which can cause these uh, you know, minor rises and fall in troponin and cause chest pain and things like that. So if a patient meets all these three criteria, then we give them the diagnosis of MINOCA or INOCA. So what's the epidemiology prevalence and uh, features? So we have pooled data and as well as other registry trials that we get this uh, data from, right? What is the percent incidence or prevalence? So um, the incidence can be anywhere between 3.5 to 11%. So anybody presenting with acute MI, um, among those patients, the presence of non-obstructive acute MI is probably close to um, 3 to 11%. Um, what is the mean age? Um, so these are usually uh, patients about 45 to 65 years of age. And registry uh, uh, studies have shown that women present more common with these, um, um, you know, side of symptomatology. So in one registry, uh, as, mu as much as 90% of the women presented with MINOCA or RINOCA. So um, although, what's the prognosis, right? So although it has better prognosis compared to obstructive coronary artery disease, MINOCA is not a benign condition. So these patients have lower survival compared to uh, healthy individuals matched for age and sex. And also there is this paradox. What, what the paradox is younger women have higher in-hospital mortality post-MI compared to the male counterparts yet um, they present with more MINOCA, which is a lower risk type of myocardial infarction. So this is a very uh, you know, present and very uh, critical problem that we see in the hospital. And overall prognosis, you know, um, the overall survival, uh, as well as uh, MACE event rates like myocardial infarction, things like that, um, are higher uh, in a patient who presents with MINOCA over the next 10 to 15 years. And uh, all-cause mortality for one year is close to 4.7%. Four-year mortality up to 13.4%, which is comparatively high. And then MI recurrence rate up to 7.1%. And this, these are patients um, who have actually presented to the hospital. So there is a subsection of patients who might not have survived uh, even up to uh, medical contact. So what's the pathology in uh, myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronaries? Um, so one of the most common would be plaque rupture. So the artery is still only 50% or less obstructed, but there could be plaque rupture. Plaque erosion, in situ thrombosis. So in patients who have uh, thrombophilia, things like that, who have higher propensity of, um, um, you know, uh, either blood disorders, anything like that. So that can cause um, minor obstructions. Uh, there could be uh, coronary artery dissection. There could be supply and demand mismatch. Say, for example, there's severe anemia uh, in these patients, and it does not um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, give good coronary perfusion. So these patients have a MI with normal, they could have normal epicardial coronaries. Coronary vasospasm is another common pathology that we see, and there could be coronary microvascular dysfunction in these patients. So um, as Dr. Parapit gave us all the guidelines, I like the ESE guidelines because I feel they're more, um, more up to the point and they give us um, good uh, criteria for diagnosing as well as for management. So um, the ESE recommends uh, the traffic light approach, which is red, yellow, and green for diagnosing and uh, managing um, uh, INOCA. So um, let me go to the, okay. So the red, so stop and consider the actual presentation of the patient. Was there a rise and fall of troponin? So you want to make sure the patient actually had myocardial infarction or ischemia. And then once the patient went to coronary angiogram, you want to review the uh, uh, cath and see, uh, you know, is there any obstructive disease? What is the percent lesion stenosis, right? So less than 50% on for the epicardial coronaries. In this uh, clinical context, um, then we go ahead and rule out other alternative diagnosis. Does patient have sepsis, uh, PE, cardiac contusion? What are the causes of uh, rise and fall of troponin, right? So once we've considered this, the next step is, um, it's pretty much diagnosis of uh, exclusion. So did we miss any other uh, obstruction? Was there a small branch vessel disease uh, that we don't see? And then re we review the angiogram findings. We look at the LV function, either through echocardiogram or LV gram on the coronary angiogram. And then obtain um, contrast cardiac MRI with gadolinium. So with, with gadolinium, this really helps us identify any scar myocardium. Um, once we've made the diagnosis, then we go to the uh, green part of it, right? So first, um, the cardiac imaging that is recommended is uh, contrast cardiac MRI, uh, coronary vascular imaging, and we could even do um, intravascular uh, ultrasound, OCT, and then coronary functional uh, testing, and then consider FFR, which is fractional uh, flow reserve in these vessels. Um, so um, the biggest thing is once we've made the diagnosis, um, you do want to... Uh, intervene on these patients because there is improved quality of life uh, and angina score is much better in these patients once we have, um, you know, intervention um, done in these patients. So how do we treat? So once we've made the diagnosis um, of Minoka um, and then we want to treat these patients. So, it, you know, we have these armamentarium of medications, you know, uh, antiplatelet medications, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, you know, anti-angel and anginal medications, um, you know, uh, and then if there is supply and demand, we treat the underlying condition. Even with all these uh, mechanisms, we do have a lot of knowledge gaps. Um, so uh, even when we put the, put the patients on all these medications, we still don't see much difference in their prognosis. Um, so I think we do um, need large clinical trials, especially, um, you know, uh, looking at women who present with these diseases and see, um, you know, what ac actually makes improvement in their prognosis. Um, so I think that's where um, uh, I'm uh, pretty excited uh, in this, uh, as of today, to be part of a cardiovascular team at uh, Dignity and St. Joe's because um, we am part of the warrior trial. Uh, I'm the PI at St. Joe's and Dr. Bond is in the East Valley. Um, uh, so we are um, recruiting right now for this trial. So this trial includes all women, which is, uh, which is very different from previous studies where uh, women in minority, uh, uh, the, recruit, uh, the population uh, were in minority. But this is an all-women study. Uh, the total idea is to uh, recruit uh, close to 2,200 uh, uh, patients. And then... Um, these are patients who have um, chest pain and who have no obstructive coronary disease, so less than 50% either on the cath or on coronary CTA. And we randomize these patients into an IMT group and then a usual group. So um, 
I'm going to go a little bit ahead. And um, so the, okay, so the IMT group is the intensive medical uh, treatment group, and we use um, high intensity uh, statin as well as ACE inhibitors and aspirin if there are no contraindications in these patients. And the usual care, uh, what we usually do for uh, guidelines. So if a patient has hypertension, we, uh, you know, we, it, it, ACE inhibitor is probably not the first line. We could use hydro, uh, hydrochlorothiazide or amlodipine in these patients, um, as well as uh, statin guidelines. So this, uh, you know, say for example, a 50-year-old uh, woman uh, with LDL of 140 might not need um, a high intensity statin according to the guidelines. But if that woman is actually randomized into IMT, she would be placed on a high intensity statin. So that's the design of the study. It's a multi center prospective randomized blinded outcome evaluation. So uh, the IMT arm is going to have intensive statin, ACE inhibitor, and aspirin, and then uh, the usual care arm. So the hypothesis is that the IMT will reduce major adverse uh, coronary events at least 20% compared to the usual care arm. Um, and the primary outcomes um, we're going to study are uh, death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, uh, TIAs, or hospitalizations for heart failure or MI. The secondary outcomes, uh, quality of life, um, you know, when can the woman get back to work or uh, return to duty, um, health resource consumption, multiple ER visits or admissions, and then angina, uh, cardiovascular death. Um, and then these are women with uh, uh, symptoms suspected to be ischemic. So chest pain, and they come to the ER or the clinic with chest pain, and uh, we do a coronary angiogram or a coronary CTA, and these are women without uh, more than 50% obstructive disease. Um, so this is the IMT arm. As I mentioned before, we use hydrostatin, um, ACE inhibitor, or ARB, and then aspirin as long as there are no contraindications. And there's lifestyle counseling as well as uh, counseling regarding smoking cessation, weight loss, and exercise as well. And uh, the usual care arm would, uh, um, th these women are being managed according to the current guidelines. This study ends 2023, so hopefully, um, you know, we will have some um, information, useful information by then.